this is our first session of uh, philosophy seminar uh, here at the IPMC for this semester. And uh, of our first speaker, we are, are having uh, Dr. John Danaher, uh, who is a senior lecturer uh, at the School of Law at the University of Galway in Ireland. And uh, John uh, has published very widely uh, over the past few years on topics uh, uh, involving legal and philosophical ethical issues uh, raised by emerging technologies, uh, has published an impressive number of papers on this. Uh, he's the author of the book Automation and Utopia, Human Flourishing in a World Without Work, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2019. Uh, he uh, has uh, addressed issues such as uh, the way uh, new technologies like virtual reality and, and automation can uh, affect uh, meaning in human life and uh, also uh, things such as the, the threat of uh, governance by algorithms or what, what he's called algocracy and how this can potentially threaten the political legitimacy of uh, decision-making processes and, and other values. Uh, I, I've been uh, reading his work uh, quite, quite a lot recently. Uh, and if you're taking my classes in uh, philosophy of AI, you will either you will have read some of his work or you will uh, in the future. Uh, I uh, can also mention that uh, as he just explained to us, now he has two blogs, uh, not uh, two podcasts, uh, my apologies, as a blog, which is called Philosophical Disquisitions, uh, where he addresses many of the, the, the topics uh, related to his, his research with various interests. Uh, and, and he has uh, a first podcast, which is also uh, focused on those issues, uh, and uh, a second one, which is focused on the ethics of academia. So he's you know, uh, very productive, and uh, we are very lucky to have him uh, today as our first speaker. So, uh, John, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Welcome to the seminar. Okay, thank you very much for that, Alexander. Um, can people hear me okay? I'm coming through loud and clear, right? All right, okay. So I'll start sharing my slides. I think uh, when I do this, I mightn't be able to see you. So if there's any issue along the way, if something's not, if, if it's not advanced or there's a pause, you just uh, say it to me and I'll be able to yeah, hear you. Um, okay, so let me try this here. Yeah, why is that? Why is that not working this time? Okay, so it is working this time. Okay. Sorry, a bit of a delay. Um, let me just pull this up here. Okay, so this is a talk that is based on a paper that I co-authored with a colleague from Norway, uh, Henrik uh, skalk -Setwa. And uh, it's about the mechanics or mechanisms of techno-moral change. So what I'll do at the outset is I'll just explain a little bit about the rationale or purpose behind this paper, the uh, the debate or the literature within which it sits. And then I'll go into discussing um, the kind of results or the various mechanisms that myself and Henrik talk about. I mean, I'll say at the outset that, I mean, I hope you find this talk interesting, but th this isn't a particularly argumentative talk. I don't have a, a, a kind of argument that I'm defending with a series of, of premises that you can challenge or dispute. Uh, some people like those kinds of talks because it generates, I guess, good discussion or conversation afterwards. If you find something objectionable, you might well find something objectionable when I say here, but it's, it, this is a slightly more descriptive and explanatory talk. It's trying to make sense of the various ways in which technology can alter or change our moral practices. You know, if, if you think I've missed something or over overlooked something or I don't appreciate some effect, that would be kind of useful feedback. It would be interesting to me. Um, so, yeah, that's just a general sort of caveat at the outset. So let me just start with explaining, like, the rationale or motivation behind this uh, paper and this whole kind of body of research. So, look, uh, a lot of people have spoken in the past about the idea that there have been historical moral revolutions. This has uh, generated... a small cottage industry of research in the past a couple of decades. Um, you know, classic instances of moral change in the past would include things like the abolition of slavery, female suffrage, the gay rights movement, etc. 
So these are instances in which societies seem to have changed what they thought was morally acceptable uh, in a relatively short period of time uh, due to kind of often, sometimes because it's a, of war, sometimes because of activist movements and so forth. And I suppose I'm interested in understanding this reality. So if it's the case that our moral beliefs and practices have changed in the past, such that we now look back on our ancestors and say, you know, how could they possibly have believed and thought this, or how could they have thought that this was morally acceptable? It seems plausible to suppose that there's nothing special about our current moment in time. We haven't reached the pinnacle of moral enlightenment. It's likely that our moral beliefs and practices will change again in the future. And so this question of, you know, where might we end up? What might we be doing today that we think is we, our our great great grandchildren will think is morally objectionable. Are there is there a potential that we'll change in a way that is morally regressive or reactionary or something like that? Um, these are the questions that I'm, I'm interested in. Like what are the what are the possible alterations or changes in the future? These are just some kind of like random possibilities here that we might evolve towards a completely different society in the future where you know, we recognize the rights of non-human beings, uh, including artificial beings. We embark upon some program of space imperialism, so like a new, a new colonialist movement in space, or because of all the problems created by technology in the modern era, we revert to a less industrial form of existence. Existence are various people who are arguing for these kinds of moral reform and revolution to happen nowadays. So this question, will they happen? And will we think that they are a, kind of a new, they, they constitute a new moral paradigm in the future? So that's, that's the kind of question I'm interested in. in taking seriously the fact of historical moral change and projecting forward or thinking into the future about what might change in the future and what significance does that have for us in the present. So that's just the kind of general background here. In terms of like defining what I'm interested in, in terms of moral change or moral revolutions, here's a rough definition. I, by a moral, re moral revolution or change, I mean a significant change in social moral beliefs and practices. I do not mean a change in ideal morality, the kind of morality that is typically studied and argued about by normative philosophers or ethicists, like what, what really ought to be done or what ought to be the case or what are the ideal set of values for humanity. I'm interested in what people actually believe on the ground about morality, what they think is morally acceptable, what they actually do, and how those things change over time. Okay, because again, with all those historical instances of moral revolution, you could just argue that what's happening there is that we're getting closer to the moral truth, right? That we were in error in the past, and now we're closer to the truth, but nothing has changed in terms of what is morally true or false. And you know, I, I pass no judgment on whether that is the, the correct way of understanding those historical episodes of, of moral change. I'm just interested in understanding the change itself and why it comes about. I think that uh, changes can obviously come about in two different dimensions of morality. There's kind of two standard branches to moral theory, the good and the right, or what I call axiology, what is good and what is bad, and deontology, what is right or what is wrong. So you can have axiological revolutions or changes, changes in what people believe to be good and bad, and deontological changes, changes in what people believe to be right or wrong. You can have one or the other, or you can have a combination of them whenever you're studying or trying to understand moral changes. Okay. So, I mean, the focus of this particular talk is going to be the role of technology in moral reform and revolution. So, so can technology play a significant part in moral reform and revolution? And what might that be? And there are some people who you know argue that technology can play a very significant role in social moral revolutions. Uh, there's one famous illustration of this that I'll start out with because it's a good practical example of the phenomenon that I'm interested in. So this is a picture uh, by uh, John Millet of a medieval knight. And there's a book by, sorry, yeah, yeah. So just in terms of setting up the um, historical context here, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, medieval European history, you know, there was a period of time when uh, knights, mounted knights, were the key kind of fighting unit in medieval armies, and they were prioritized and valued by kings and leaders to such an extent that a whole social moral system was set up around them. 
which is usually described in terms of this thing, the feudal pyramid. It's a, this was uh, basically the order of medieval European society where you had a king who sat at the top of the social order, who granted land to lords and vassals, and they granted territory to knights. Knights controlled large estates, and everyone on that estate worked to serve the knight uh, and to you know equip him, to tra- uh, help him have equipment and food and uh, enable him to train and be ready to serve in the army of the king. So how, how did this social moral system come about with its kind of hierarchical ordering, its system of property rights and rules, and its um, it, it, you know, significant inequality? Well, there's an argument from um, a historian called Lin White Jr., which claims that this bit of technology here that I display on screen, and for those who are not familiar with it, this is a, a stirrup for a horse. So you know, these are things that you, you stand into if you're riding a horse. It allows you to um, basically maintain your balance on the horse uh, without having to kind of use the power of your own uh, legs or and also to stand up if needs be. And this was a key technological innovation that made mounted knights uh, a significant and useful fighting unit. This is how Lin White Jr. describes it in his book, Medieval Technology and Social Change. He says the stirrup, by giving lateral support in addition to the front and back support offered by pommel and cantle, those are other parts of the saddle, effectively welded the horse and rider into a single fighting unit capable of violence without precedent. The fighter's hand no longer delivered the blow, it merely guided it. The stirrup thus replaced human energy with animal power and immensely increased the warrior's ability to damage his enemy. Immediately, without preparatory steps, it made possible mounted shock combat, a revolutionary new way of doing battle. So it essentially allowed knights to hold these large um, spears, lances, and drive them into their enemies using the power of the horse, not their own kind of human power to do that. And that made them a very kind of, I guess, a, a kind of medieval equivalent of a weapon of mass destruction or something like that. And this was such a significant revolution that it led to the valuing of the knight and the creation of the, the feudal society or system. That's Lin White Jr.'s thesis. Is, so it's this one technology caused this significant social moral change. Now, you know, there's lots of dispute about Lin White Jr.'s thesis as whether it's accurate, it's very technologically determinist. But I think he's probably correct to say that the technology, the stirrup, did play some significant role in making knights more valuable, and that played some significant role in changing the social moral order in medieval society. So that's one historical example of a technology that seems to change a social moral practice. What are the other examples? What and how does it all work? That's what I'm interested in. And there's a theory that I use to explore this or understand this. It's been developed by a number of philosophers of technology, which is that you know, technology doesn't, isn't the sole cause of change, but it is a key mediator of change. So uh, Dutch philosopher Peter Paul Verbeek makes this argument specifically in relation to the moral effects of technology. He's developed this theory of the technological mediation of morality, which claims that the technologies in use, as he says here in this quote, help to establish relationships between human beings and their environment, And in these relationships, technologies are not merely silent intermediaries, but they are active mediators that help to constitute the entities that have a relationship through the technology. So by organizing relations between humans and the world, technologies play an active, though not final, role in morality. Uh, I don't know if is somebody saying something to me or is there, that was just somebody joining the talk. Is it? Okay, sorry. There was a notification that just popped up. Um, so the, the key... The key I, Sorry? No, no uh, sorry, just maybe I yeah, mentioned if people have questions, could you bear, in mind, bear them in mind or write them down, but wait until the end of the talk. Uh, maybe that's the best way to proceed. Sorry, John. Go on. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's more that I can't see the, the chat as I'm going through this. Um, yeah. Yes, so, someone just raised their hand. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the, the key point in, in Peter Paul Verbeek's idea is that. 
uh, technology is not value neutral. That's I guess the way one is making here. It's not a it's not a silent intermediary. It's not merely an, a tool of human agency, but it has some kind of active role in shaping or reconstituting our understanding of moral values and moral practices. Uh, yeah, but but the key point is, as he is in that quote there is that it plays an active but not a final role. So it's, it's not the sole determining factor, but it is an active participant in changing moral practices. So that's what I'm interested in figuring out is what what active role can technologies play in changing uh, moral beliefs and practices in facilitating or precipitating moral revolutions. Okay. Now, why why would you care about this phenomenon? Why would you want to work out what the mechanisms of techno moral change are? Maybe this is obvious to many of you, but it's worth being specific about it. I think there's like two main rationales behind the paper that I wrote with Henrik. Uh, one is a I guess a practical or normative rationale is that I want to try and predict and anticipate possible future changes or ongoing changes, and potentially offer practical guidance to designers or policymakers. Who are interested in how technology might affect future morality. And it's worth bearing in mind here that the stakes are very real when it comes to this uh, topic because there are people who create technologies that claim that it is reshaping or changing our moral practices in a significant way. You know, notoriously, Mark Zuckerberg is, is usually uh, claimed to have said the following in, back in 2010 that privacy is no longer a social norm because of technology, that you know, people are willing to trade privacy for the digital convenience of um, social media and different online services. Now, it turns out like he didn't exactly say this. This is sort of a, a simplification of what he actually said. He, he's actually said something like this, which is that people have gotten comfortable sharing more information and different kinds of information. And the social norm of, of privacy is something that's evolving over time. So we're evolving away from privacy as a normal right. That's his claim. So he's making that claim on behalf of his technology. There's many people who resist it. Okay, but the point here is that there are people creating technologies that are claiming that they are shifting or changing our moral priorities. And so it seems like we might want to try and understand that, predict it, anticipate it, and if it needs be, stop it or encourage it. So that's the practical rationale. There's also then a scholarly rationale behind this particular paper, this attempt to present a taxonomy of the mechanisms of moral change, which is that there's lots of individual case studies being done and uh, you know articles about specific technologies and the potential changes that they might bring about. There's very little attempt at systemizing or bringing order to uh, those different case studies, to seeing if there are common mechanisms and if there are common patterns to moral change. So that's one of the rationales here is to unify and bring order and systematization to the scholarly debate about techno-moral change. All right, so that, that, that's all sort of just setting the stage as to why I'm looking at this topic, why I think it's important. In terms of the kind of substance of, of this paper, then the, the thesis such as it is, that myself and Henrik came up with is that we think there are six primary mechanisms through which technology changes social, moral beliefs and practices, and that these mechanisms can be categorized into three domains. Decisional, so they affect how we make decisions. Relational, they affect how we relate to other people. And perceptual, they affect how we perceive and understand the world. And what I want to do is I'm going to walk through these six mechanisms and give examples of technologies that seem to be changing moral beliefs and practices in each of these um, domains. So the first mechanism of moral change is that technology adds options. It gives us the means of achieving goals, attaining values that were previously unavailable, a way of discharging our obligations or not, or ignoring our obligations that was previously unavailable to us. Okay, so this seems like a, a very basic effect of technology. Once a technology is created, we can do something that we previously were not able to do. Okay, and then, so it changes the space of options and actions available to us. Okay, sometimes we can use technology to close off options that were once available, but that's usually because it adds the option of closing off an option. So again, the net effect tends to be to, to add options. So again, you think about this very simplistically, in the days before 
um, you know, uh, horse and carriage or automobile. The only way of getting about was primarily by walking. So if you wanted to visit a friend of yours, you'd have to walk to their house. You, you didn't have any choices. You just had one option available to you. Once we mastered or controlled horses, you could, and if you owned one, you could ride a horse to your friend's house. More recently, then you could have the option of using a car or public transport or something like that to drive to your friend's house. And so you have different options available to you as a result of technological innovations or changes. And these choices and decisions can be morally loaded, okay? And that, you know, you might be able to get to your destination quicker with a car. So do you have an obligation to get there quicker? There might be downstream harms caused by using a particular kind of technology. It might add to pollution. It might add to traffic congestion. So do you have an obligation not to use the technology as a result of those changes? So by adding options, you're changing the moral calculus of decision-making, okay? Here's a couple of other examples. With the invention of the smartphone with internet connectivity and um, social media has given us all now an option when we're out and about of uh, kind of on constant online distraction, right? So instead of just sitting silently with your thoughts when you're riding on the train or um, you know, going for a walk, you now have the option of distracting yourself in some way. So should you exercise that option? Is that a good or bad thing? Is it virtuous? Or when it comes to responding to people, okay, should you respond to work emails now that you have your phone on you at all times and you have the option of doing so? Or do you have an obligation not to do so because it creates a norm of responsivity that uh, other people feel obliged to live up to. That's not fair to them. Here's another example, and this is the one that's kind of well studied in the academic literature. There's a couple of people who've written about it. The invention of the mechanical ventilator created a new moral dilemma or question. Is it permissible to keep someone alive after brain death to facilitate organ donation? Before the invention of that technology, we didn't have that option. Okay, it wasn't uh, something that was uh, available to us. But with the invention of the technology, it became a possibility. And the question was whether it was permissible. So Robert Baker and Philip Nickel have written about this extensively. I mean, there's more to it as well. Like, it's not just that the invention of the mechanical ventilator created a new moral dilemma or question. It also changed certain, our attitudes towards certain morally loaded concepts. Like, what, what does it mean for somebody to be dead? Right. This, the idea or the concept of brain death came in largely in tandem with the invention of a mechanical ventilator. So that's a, a technology that had a significant impact on moral beliefs and practices by adding options, adding choices to our lives. So that's the first mechanism. The second mechanism, and this is sort of closely related to the first one, is that when it adds options, it also changes decision-making costs. It makes it both harder and easier to access certain values or to do the right thing. Okay, here's a case study. And th this is probably one of like the best studied um, examples. There's lots of papers written about the moral effects of contraceptive technology. So what, what impact did the invention of you have safe and effective contraception, particularly the contraceptive pill, have on the ethics of extramarital sex. Now, I use the term extramarital sex uh, for an kind of odd reason, but for the most part, it, the interest here is in premarital sex, the sex that people had before they got married. So the, most of the data or studies here are based on US information. So there's a couple of economists, Jeremy Greenwood and um, Gunnar is the, the surname of the other person, but Jeremy Greenwood has written a book about this, about the kind of moral effects of certain technologies on family life, including sexual relations. And so in that book, they look at data based from the year 1900 about uh, what were the odds of, of a woman being, becoming pregnant um, if they had uh, sex in any given year without contraception or with any available means of contraception in the year 1900. So there were some primitive forms of contraception available in 1900. So they found is that 
um, without contraception is about an 85% chance of pregnancy in any given year. And with the available methods of contraception, there's still about a 45 to 50% chance of contraception in any given year. So when it comes to the decision to have sex outside of marriage, uh, pre, uh, pre the invention of the contraceptive pill, there's kind of a, a significant risk of an, of an unwanted pregnancy or and a pregnancy that would have somewhat deleterious or difficult um, social consequences for the person in question, uh, either through kind of shame or uh, forced marriage or something like this. Um, so that, that for many people, that meant that the kind of the benefits of having sex outside of marriage uh, were significantly outweighed by the cost of doing so. So very few people did at the time, and they, they look at the data on this as well. Um, so it's a, a minority of women specifically uh, availed of that option in the year 1900. Then fast forward to the year 2000, post the invention of latex condoms and contraceptive pills. And suddenly the, the calculus has changed very significantly. The, the actual chances of having pregnancies seem to have reduced to below 10% in many cases. Um, and, it, and if people use the contraceptive pill correctly, they take it on a regular basis, the risk is even lower than that. So the advantages, advantages in contraceptive technology dramatically reduced the costs associated with having sex out of, outside of marriage, to the social costs, the shame, and so forth. Um, and presumably made the benefits of that more salient. And so far more people avail of that option. So much so that like essentially what's happened in the uh, kind of 100 years or so since the invention of you know, safer and more effective methods of contraception is that in most societies, um, this can broadly be true around the world, younger people, younger generations think that there's nothing wrong with having sex outside of marriage um, before you get married. Okay, and e even in countries where there are religious institutions or social institutions that are opposed to that practice, they're almost universally ignored. Okay, so this, um, Greenwood and his colleagues did kind of surveys or looked at survey data of people in Catholic countries, for instance, which are opposed to the use of contraception. And they find that, you know, most young people, even though if they're nominally Catholic, ignore the moral uh, um, demands of the Catholic Church and think that uh, sex outside of marriage is morally permissible. So that's an example of a technology that changes the decision-making calculus. Okay. So to, to kind of sum up, technology reduced the negative costs of the action and thereby enabled people to access a value, namely sexual intimacy more readily. Now, not everyone was persuaded by that, but, and some institutions continue to fight against it. But many people now seem to have accepted that premarital sex is permissible as part of the general of sexual revolution that you see in many uh, Western societies in particular. Now, I mean, that's, an, that's a case study in which uh, the, the technology reduces costs and makes a value salient. Technology can also do the opposite. It can, it can make it more difficult to attain values. So here's a more current example, the advent of deep fake technology. So synthetic media, the ability to create relatively realistic audiovisual outputs. This is the infamous um, Obama example. So this is the, I don't know if this video will work here. This is a video of Obama um, giving a talk. So the image on the right hand side of the screen is a deep fake. It's an artificial uh, representation or synthetic representation of him. And so deep fakes and other forms of, I suppose, digital misinformation increase the costs of finding out the truth and thereby make it more difficult to access the value of truth. All right, so they, they change the cost of benefits as well, and then that can have an impact on uh, social moral beliefs and practices. If you're interested, uh, myself and Henrik wrote an entire paper about this, about the role of the impact of technology on truth and trust where we talk about this case study in, in more detail. The second mechanism. The third uh, mechanism is that technology enables new relationships. 
Okay, so for example, transport and communications technologies can give us access to new human relationship partners, and other technologies can create wholly new non-human relationship partners. Okay. So, I mean, human morality is largely relational. It's about how we relate to other people and we view relationships as sources of value, okay, uh, intimacy, friendship. These are valuable relationships. The people that we relate to are the ones to whom we think we owe moral duties, for instance. So any impact on relationships is morally salient. So for example, dating apps increase the pool of potential human partners, whereas once you were limited to your social group, the uh, who you associated with, now you can kind of access a much a larger market of potential dating partners. Robots, AIs could be potential relationship partners. This is a more controversial idea, but could, you know, could they be companions or friends for certain people? There are advantages to this, the increased opportunities for valuable relationships, a greater distribution of relational goods and values, more people have access to valuable relationships than they did before. There's also a downside to it, right? Um, so, so one of the problems is that te technology doesn't just increase the pool of potential relationship partners, it also typically changes how we relate to people. We don't relate to them in flesh and blood interactions anymore, we relate to them through screens or through apps, through text messages. Okay, so some people worry that this strips away some of the important contextual features of human relationships and things that make them really valuable. It results in a more transactional or instrumental approach to relationships. Instead of thinking that you need to compromise with people, you say, well, I can move on to another uh, potential partner. Uh, some people complain about this in the kind of modern dating world, that people don't settle as much. Uh, their compromise as much, they say, well, there's another person out there, I'll try and find somebody else. This can lead to an increased sense of regret or loss about potential relationships that you could be having if you just explored the pool of potential relationship partners a bit more. In the case of robots and AIs, one of the main ethical debates out there is that even if people do form bonds or attachments with them, robots lack important properties that humans have. We can debate whether that's true or not, or, or whether it's likely to be true forever. And this will result in relationships that have less value or will have a different kind of value than equivalent human relationships. Okay, so for example, um, when people talk about like sexual or intimate relationships with machines, they think that that will uh, be a more kind of controlling, manipulative, power-based type of relationship as opposed to a relationship of mutuality and compromise with a a human partner, and that might be something to worry about when it comes to the, the ethics of relationships. Another like obvious point I would make about um, enabling new relationships is that it, it leads to this question, which a lot of people have written about in terms of moral progress and moral history, about the expanding circle of, of moral concern. Right? That historically, morality used to be very parochial. We used to think that we only owed moral duties to our friends and neighbors, our tribe, over time, our moral circles have expanded to include everyone in our nation, our state, everyone in the world. If you follow like international human rights law principles, people argue that we should expand the moral circle to include animals. You know, Peter Singer famously argued for this in his book called The Expanding Circle. And uh, some people now argue, well, will we include artificial others in the expanding moral circle too? So it, uh, it by enabling new relationships, we tend to automatically raise this new moral question about whether the moral circle expands or not. Okay, so that's the third mechanism. The fourth mechanism, and this is all kind of still within the relational domain, is that in addition to adding new potential relationships, technology changes the burdens and expectations within relationships. Okay, and, and this is kind of closely related to the first two mechanisms as well. Right, by, so by changing options and decision-making costs, we have to reevaluate what it is that we can and ought to do for one another. And this impacts upon our social role-related duties. So there's um, kind of famous historical illustration of this. There's a evolutionary and developmental psychologist, Michael Tomasello, who is reasonably well known for experiments that he's done on cooperation in you know, chimpanzees and children. 
and also has various theories about the origins of human morality. Where, where did human moral systems come from? Well, Thomas Ello argues that they, human morality as a psychological phenomenon came largely from the origins of big game hunting. So the invention of throwing weapons like spears enabled humans to hunt larger animals. But to do this effectively, they had to hunt in packs and groups. They had to cooperate with one another. And this meant that people had to realize that they had a certain role to fulfill within the cooperative group. You know, one person maybe had to chase the animal into the open and the other person would fell it with a spear or there, again, there'd be groups of people doing this. And this created a, a rich kind of psychology of, uh, that we associate with social morality. And this is roughly the model that uh, Tomasello argues for in his book, right? Is that once we engaged in cooperative activities like this, we created the sense that there is a joint mind, a, a kind of collective agency working towards a common goal, and that we each fulfill roles relative to that common goal. I must chase the animal, you must fill it with your spear. If you don't live up to your role, I can blame you for what you did. I can hold you responsible for not doing so. If I don't live up to my role, I feel guilt or shame for not doing so. So the important one here is that Tomasello's claim is essentially that the invention of a technology, the throwing weapon, the spear, is responsible for the basic idea of social morality, the notion that we owe things to one another and that we can be blamed for not living up to our duties. So that's kind of historical case study of, of this phenomenon. More recent examples that you might look at, well, um, here's a slightly controversial example. Uh, have domestic so-called labor-saving technologies changed the burdens and expectations of domestic work? So you can read you know, really interesting historical accounts of the amount of time spent on cleaning clothes in the 1800s and the kind of backbreaking labor involved in that process. The invention of the electrical washing machine appeared to change that. You could wash clothes much faster or sooner. Some people view this as a kind of a liberating technology. So it meant that women, particularly since the, the division of labor tended to be highly gendered, um, could spend less time on this task and that would increase their opportunities for work outside the home. So there's kind of an optimistic story here that there was a changed burden on women and this gave them a new opportunity. There's, there's a, an alteration in the, the balance of power within the relationship as well. Other people think that it actually hasn't had that effect. It um, has it instead, because it's easy to wash clothes, you could do it quickly and cheaply. It's increased the demand for clean clothes. So people just wash clothes more often. And also it's still women who are largely expected to do this task, okay? But either way, I mean, I don't know, there's kind of evidence you can find for both of those stories being true. Um, but either way, what, what's happening is that the technology is to some extent changing the burdens and expectations within the domestic context, the domestic relationship, either in the sense of, okay, you have re reduced the expectation of spending time washing clothes, so you, you now have the opportunity to do something else, or, and you should do something else, like maybe finding a job outside of the home. Or it's that, well, you now you need to do more of that work and make sure that uh, the clothes are cleaner. So that's uh, the fourth mechanism. It changes the uh, burdens and expectations within a relationship. The fifth mechanism, which again is, is closely associated to this, is that technology changes the balance of power within relationships. So relationships are rarely perfectly equal. Oftentimes one person or one group has more power than the other and technology can reduce or increase an imbalance of power and this can have reasonably dramatic moral effects. I'll just use one illustration of this from, actually two illustrations of this, from uh, Stephen Barley, who's a, an industrial sociologist, does a lot of work in companies and that the impact that technology has in companies. And he adopts this thing called the dramaturgical theory of technological change, which is that in all social settings, people play roles, they follow scripts that have norms embedded within them. And technology often disrupts the scripts that people have within uh, working organizations, okay? 
So his key point is that technology is that it's most disruptive to social morality when it has the power to change the roles enacted by people within a social setting, particularly changing the balance or imbalance in their relative moral burdens and by increasing or reducing the power of one role relative to another. And one kind of concrete illustration of this, which is based on an ethnographic study that he did in car dealerships in the US, was the impact of internet-based car sales on the relationship between customers and sellers in car dealerships. Okay, so th this might be a largely kind of US phenomenon, but the historical norm or classic model of a car salesperson is uh, somebody who's slightly shady and greasy and um, manipulative. So you go into a car dealership, the salesperson greets you, and they use all these kind of tricks to force you into buying a car. And uh, Barley documents all the tricks that they use in quite some detail in his studies, and it notes that like many uh, car salespeople who use that classic in-person model of selling a car will often lie to the customers to try and build empathy with them. Uh, so they often lie about whether they have families or children, for example, and they'll lie about the urgency with which the person needs to make the decision to buy the car, claiming that there's, you know, if they don't buy it today, they're not going to get the car. Okay, so the, 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 the classic model is a, a highly unequal one. The car dealer really has all the information and has all the power, and they can avail of all these tricks and practices to force a sale. With the advent of internet-based car sales, it's a very different scenario because most people are now not buying cars in person. They're buying them over the phone or online, and they go into the dealership just to finalize the sale to make sure that it's the car that they want to buy. They, the people who are at home on their computers often have the ability to search for through other car dealerships to see if they can get a better price. They can find out all the information they want about the car. And Barley, again, documents in his study that this has created a more equal relationship between the salesperson and the customer and has forced them to be more honest in their interaction. So he notes that uh, the internet-based car dealers rarely lie. They pretty much never lie about the prices of their cars. They're almost scrupulously honest about how much the car uh, costs. Uh, and they also make very little profit on each individual sale, their goal is to maximize number of sales to increase profitability. Whereas in the old model, the goal was to increase the margin of profit on each individual sale. So the internet here has changed the balance of power and changed the kind of norms or moral rules that are followed by the different parties. Uh, here's another kind of like illustration of this, which, um, this is just more my idea than um, based on any kind of study. But like, what's the impact of automation and like AI-based assistance on human social relationships and hierarchies? Well, in one sense, you know, the, the availability of an AI assistant who could tell you what the weather is or could tell you how to get from A to B using a mapping service or something like that reduces your dependency on other human beings and reduces the need for some kinds of social interactions. So you've reduced dependency on others. And so you might think that that raises your power relative to them because you're less dependent on them. But at the same time, uh, it also increases your dependency on what I would call distal others, people that you can't necessarily see or appreciate because those AI based assistants or services are controlled by corporations. Um, and you are now more reliant on them as a result of uh, the invention of this technology. So again, it changes the balance of power and um, can have an impact on, on social morality in that way. Okay, I'm, I'm now winding up. Um, so the last mechanism then is that, and this is probably the most ab abstract mechanism, is that technology can affect morality by changing the metaphors and mental models that we use to understand the world, okay? Can provide us with new information, new analogies, for understanding how the world works, and this can change our moral perception of the world. So this is a very weird uh, diagram, but it's um, based on a paper actually written by Peter Paul Verbeek, who I mentioned earlier as one of the founders of this theory of the technological mediation of morality. And his point is that technology can change how we perceive 
and understand the world. It could either present us with imagery of the world or present us with new theories or models of the world. So his go-to example is the invention of obstetric ultrasound technology. So the ability to see the fetus in utero as it is developing. And his claim is that this is um, a morally charged technology because it, instead of the unborn being invisible to us, not something that we could ever see or relate to, obstetric ultrasound reveals the unborn to us in terms of variables that mark its health condition, like the fold and the nape of the neck of the fetus. Ultrasound translates the unborn child into a possible patient, congenital diseases into preventable forms of suffering, provided that abortion is an available option, and expecting a child into choosing for a child. Okay, so uh, parents can develop this relationship with their uh, unborn child in a way that wasn't previously accessible to them. They could see it as a possible patient, recipient of um, certain kinds of medical intervention or uh, prevention. And uh, this, this affects the morality of, of pregnancy, the moral beliefs and practices associated with pregnancy. That's his claim. So the, the imagery presented to us by the technology changes our moral perception of the situation. Here are some other examples. So social media plus the smartphone it changes the way in which we can understand and experience everyday life. Life is now not just something that we experience in the moment. It is something that can be shared, can be archived, can be monetized. Okay. There's some very like interesting, again, ethnographic studies done of social media influencers and how they understand the value of their everyday lives. Uh, that they, a lot of them don't value anything they do for its own sake. They value it for instrumental purposes because of how it can be leveraged to increase their influence, increase their monetization, increase their market value. Um, so, I mean, th those are all cases where uh, the technology just presents us with kind of a new way of understanding everyday life. There, there's also this idea that uh, technology presents to us new kind of mental models or theories. So this is a more abstract idea from my colleague, uh, Henrik uh, Skagsetra. So Walter Benjamin wrote about this idea years ago of so-called ratomorphy, right? It's the opposite of uh, anthropomorphization which is that, you know, a lot of experimental scientists in order to understand human psychology and human behavior use animal models. And one of the most common animal models is the rat. So you, you get the rat to perform a, a, an activity in a box or in a, or a game or something like that. And you can track its brain activity and so forth. And you can use this as an experimental model to understand the human based on the principle because of evolutionary conservation that there's a lot of similarity between the basic structure of a rat and, and a human. And so the idea is here is that, according to Benjamin, is that the persistent use of the rat encourages us to actually see the human as being something like a rat. So it's not just that we see the rat as being like a human, but we kind of flip it around and we see the human as being, to some extent, like a rat. So uh, Henrik argues that the persistent and pervasive use of robots as a, in experimental and social settings might encourage us to see humans as a kind of robot. So a lot of people worry about the anthropomorphization of robots or a tendency to ascribe human traits to robots. But what about the opposite? About us, uh, us understanding humans in robot-like terms? And bear in mind, this has already happened. You know, the computational theory of the mind is one of the you know, leading models or theories in cognitive science. And the claim is that this could have an impact on social moral practices as well. So one of the main examples that Henrik uses is to do with nudging, the ethics of nudging. And the idea is that, um, you know, if, if we think that humans are just kind of like defective robots in some way, then yeah, it makes sense to want to restructure the choice environment so that we behave in a more rational manner. So it kind of lends increased permissibility to that kind of nudging ethos or ethic. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, this is, these are all the mechanisms sort of explained across those three domains. So you have decisional, relational, perceptual. Technology changes morality by adding options. 
altering decision-making costs, enabling new relationships, changing the burdens and expectations within relationships, changing the balance of power, and changing our mental models and metaphors. Okay, so thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.